Hello and welcome to the Artfully Learning audio series. I'm your host, Adam Zucker. On today's episode, I'll be joined by Rich Dolan. Rich is a naturalist and an artist, and both of these practices are complementary to one another and have led to an educational campaign that makes scientific learning about whales and the overall issue of ocean conservation an accessible experience for many different people. Dolan provides interactive sculptures to educators affiliated with museums and whale watch companies. His mission is to demystify the behavior and physiology of enigmatic creatures through the universal language of sculpture and visual art. Dolan's sculptures enable an educator to provide detailed visual examples while teaching on boats or in the field. Scaled-down replicas of whales represent species often too large for live display in most aquariums and museums. All right. Hey. Alan, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Am I coming in good? Oh, yeah. No, you're coming in great. Uh, awesome. Cool. Right, cool. Awesome. <laughs> right on. So, yeah, thank you. It's it's a pleasure to meet you, first of all, Richard. You know, I've, I don't know how I came across your work, but uh, I did and somehow started following you on Instagram. I know that we both were connected to P-Town for a while and the Cape Cod scene. So maybe through the art scene there. Some- yeah, it's an interesting age that we live in because we form these connections with one another now through another template of social media and um i feel like in the past i mean traditionally with art it was so passive like you would just put a message out into the ether and it would be received by a viewer or another artist like either through viewing a piece or through publications but now it's so immediate to me, that's been great. I know there's a lot of pushback on that. You know, I'm from a traditional like background of being an artist and an art historian. It's kind of like uh, you need to see work in person. But at the same time, I wouldn't be able to connect with certain artists in in a social environment if it wasn't for you know social media, of course, because we're obviously on opposite ends of the physical earth. So that's uh now we are so yeah so you've been going more and more uh westward since cape cod yeah that seems to be the migration uh, just more and more west until i eventually wrap back around but yeah it's so interesting to, to see the um cultural pushback on social media of which i definitely was a participant because I just think of it as another medium that artists can use for spreading a message or communicating. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I just wrote about AI and I've been asked to uh, talk to a a class of art educators about it, which, you know, I actually don't think that I'm the best person to do that because I've never been involved in it. You know, I'm just more from a perspective of could it be an interesting tool? It's strange, but it's a brave new world we're living in, you know, and people are making art on social media. My whole life, there's been this digital art wave anyway, so. Yeah, I'd, re- I'd reckon you're as good a person to talk about um, AA art as anyone, like who is really an authority on sculpture or a painting. I mean, I'd reckon the viewer's perspective is as important as the artist, so. Yeah, if you're living in a community where a new art form becomes present, yeah, you're just as authorized to speak of it as the next person. True. Yeah. I mean, and that goes back to that whole educational uh, philosophy as art as experience. Yeah. I think this is a good point, too, to, to really jump into the uh, the conversation that I that I want to have about your work in particular. And I like to start off these audio series episodes with like a, a fun question that I like to ask artists who recall their earliest memories of an artistic experience. And in your case, what I'd like to know, sort of what came first, the whales or the art? And after that, when was the first work of art you made that focused on marine life? That's a question that I'm actually asked often is how did I get here? Um, because now I work as an educator for whale watch companies and nonprofits. And when I was back in art school, um, back in Montreal College of Art in Beverly, um, at that point, I was not active in conservation, but a lot of my imagery would go back to nature. Like I I worked with this professor, um, Timothy Harney, and I can't talk about art without talking about him 
very formulative in my career. Um, he was a life drawing teacher and <clears throat> naturally the human form was something that was explored a lot, but he also opened our minds to non-objective work and collage. But again, still coming back to animal figuration, um, I ended up getting my BFA, moved to Boston. Not really a lot of work for new young artists at that time professionally. That's when we had that small depression. A lot of galleries were closing or moving off Newberry Street. So I found myself volunteering at the New England Aquarium, looking at um, lobsters, American lobsters. And from there, I got an internship through the New England Aquarium Whale Watch. And after working on those boats for a few years, still being active as an artist, I noticed that a lot of our um, passengers, a lot of our audience, they were very diversified in language. And there was a school for the blind that would come on those boats. And... I remember thinking to myself, this is a way to watch, but everyone watches differently. Like, not just in terms of sensory impairment, but just as individuals, we interpret things through ambiguity. Like, no two people can look at the same painting and see the same thing, see the same color relationship at the same time. So everyone's out looking at these wild animals being humpback whales. And I noticed through first contact that there was still a dissociation between what people are familiar with in the media regarding whales and what they see in the field. But then for passengers who are sight impaired, how do I get them active? How do I get them integrated in something that they are not experiencing in the same way so i thought well if i was to bring those animals on the boats which is illegal you can't do that you can't pick up a humpback whale feasibly there's never been one captain activity um, captivity because they're so big so i thought well if i make sculpture that can visually explain that animal's anatomy and it also prolongs the experience but if I'm working three-dimensionally in sculpture, that's also an interaction for people who maybe have difficulty in vision. So I started making the whale sculptures back in 2016 just as an educational tool to reach a more diverse audience. And I've been making them for several years since. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that. This is like enlightening to me that you mentioned about the... Um, the visually impaired visitors on your uh, whale watches that really was sort of the impetus behind the educational sculptures you make. I mean, there's so much importance behind making art accessible. Obviously, as you mentioned too, your educational journey was all about different ways of interpreting uh, paintings and sculpture and seeing how different forms could be used accessibly. Uh, and you mentioned the Montserrat connection, I think, is how we know one another, too, because I have many close friends who went to Montserrat, I'm sure, in the same time frame. So that's, I think that's how we, I don't know if we met personally now, I'm, I'm trying to still put that all together. But anyway, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, part about the visual impaired visitors on your whale watching tours that led you to create these sculptures, you know, these kinetic sculptures that, that can be felt and uh, touched and inspire haptic learning. Because that was sort of the basis, I think, for this art educational revolution. You know, Victor Lowenfeld, who's a key figure everyone talks about in art education, the guy who is credited for talking about the stages of artistic development, his start was teaching art to blind students in Vienna. And that informed the, the whole idea of like that we learn differently visually. But a major part of art is something that many people still in the arts don't consider and that's haptic learning both the combination of like visual and touch so you're you're doing that through your art making it accessible to people and that people deserve to see art and also deserve to experience these fascinating awe-inspiring experiences like a whale watch yeah it's a, it's really um <clears throat> it's a surreal kind of physical environment i never would have thought of making my art physical being 
like someone who's been painting and drawing for the last couple of decades. And it's like, when I hear the word gallery now, I think about the context of my art where it's now like on vessels, it's on physical boats. Like my art is made for hanging on walls, but it's often now held by hand. Um, and I've maybe shown in one or two galleries in like the past decade because my work is just always out there in the elements. Um, it, it makes me think back to you talking about like artificial intelligence and art where right now it's just so new and I'm inclined as a traditionalist to really push against it, but we don't know the true implications or the benefits of a art um, now because it's so fresh, but in the future, these technologies that we push against always end up being valuable resources like when um, we start pushing away from fossil fuel and seeking renewable energy through the wind, um, through the sun, you, you have all this industry pushing against it. You know, it's always like the people on top, but it's also these people in trades like mining or other vocations who think the livelihoods put at risk. But it's just the growing pains of technology. Like we see it in trades and we're seeing it in art right now and i don't know the benefits of ai but maybe in 10 or 20 years maybe we'll kind of tiptoe away for a bit or maybe we'll find use for it as fine artists and storytellers as you said there's definitely pros and cons of all that stuff you know artists should just keep focusing on making the artwork whether it's through the use of AI generators or whatever that entails or traditional. And of course, there's going to be a need and a place for both. You know, it's not going to be the death of traditional art because of course, what AI can't do in, in these terms, you know, it's not like creating the actual haptic qualities of art as of now it's it's learning things alongside you know the way similar to the way we learn through looking at images and looking at the different properties of images and singling out say if someone wants to make a whale ai created whale art you know, they would just put in i guess the tag whale and you know the then the machine is just looks through these databases of images but it sort of mimics i guess in a way too that we differentiate between whales and other cetaceans and the machines doing that and i'm that's obviously mimics how we learn and how we develop artistically but it's going to be part of the future we need to uh certainly coexist with these technologies and hopefully use them to our benefits and ethically as well which is something that it's tough right you know it's it's a tough conversation but um you know, your work is very geared on a major moral and ethical dilemma that we are facing too, because a lot of these these creatures, these amazing cetaceans are largely at risk. And you talked about certain industries, you know, there's still whaling going on. And I mean, there's a cultural aspect to that, right? The indigenous cultures, but there's also like things in like the Faroe Islands or these whale hunts that's that admittingly the populations do not need to do it but they still continue to do it so there's that cultural dilemma you know i remember my grandparents would have ivory like actual ivory whale tooth art scrimshaw and like it was compelling for me to look at those things sourced from you know when they went to trips through canada and north america where these indigenous cultures do make art but it comes at a cost of the killing of whales so that's something I'm wondering, like, because your work is the antithesis of that. You know, you're, you want people to learn about how we can conserve these creatures, how we can coexist with them in the present and the future. And you're creating the likeness of these animals on these very scale models that people can actually see without posing a threat to them. So I want to know, you know, maybe your thoughts on anything from that whole aspect of the cultural implications of humans and whales interacting and how you see your work as part of that conversation. I think when I was younger, I used to have this kind of um, hypothetical future or this fantasy that I would be up in a cabin in the Pacific Northwest and I would just make art and I would like hide myself away from the world and then there'd just be like, paintings that would leave my estate and make their way into a museum. And I could just go unseen. Um, and 
it replicates this mindset that I had early on in art school where I was just like, you know what, damn everyone else. I'm just going to make what I want to make and it will exist and do all the talking for me. Um, but I was, I was naive at that point because I was not accepting the truth that artists, we do not exist in an echo chamber. And what we're doing is we're providing commentary, whether it's on culture or society or just the way we see, like we're just a mirror for what's happening around us. So when I started making whale art, it was from more of a like interpretive scientific standpoint where I would say, this is a whale and you're not experiencing it in its fullness because there's the um, partition of ocean from air. So these are avatars through which we can connect with these animals. But then um, working in the whale watch world, I got more into conservation and I've been going to conferences and talking to researchers and people who have been working with um, endangered species. And they face a lot of threats today. Whaling certainly has had a sizable impact on whales through the 1800s and 1900s. And today, yeah, there's still sustenance communities um, who are harvesting whales come um, culturally, but not commercially. But they're not the biggest threat to whales. It's all of us. Um, there is a veterinarian who works with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, Michael J. Moore, and he just wrote a book called We Are All Whalers. I think the plight of whales and our responsibility. And in that book, we're still whaling today through our management of resources and through our consuming of um, fish through industrial fisheries. Whales are collateral for our modern day industry. They get wrapped up in fishing gear. They're eating plastic particulates that enter the ocean that bioaccumulate for the food chain. So fish are eating plastic and then we're also eating fish, but we're also eating fish too. So now we're building up plastics. And of course, um, climate change affecting blooms of plankton so that whales have to travel further and further from the mating grounds to find their food. So a lot of the threats whales are contending with today, um, some of them, like climate change, are not immediately visible. So my art has moved more in that direction, where when I look at people painting or sculpting whales today, I think about what message they're communicating, and I often find that it's just like the, um, the presence of a whale in context of our experience with them, but not enough art is being made about the problems that they're facing. So recent imagery has been um, whales like wrapped up in, in gear, like with injuries. And it's not the kind of art that I think people want hanging in their home, but it's the kind of art that right now the whales are calling for. I suppose. So whaling is always a good introductory message for our interaction with them, but it's more these, um, these consequences of modern industry that are the biggest threat, I suppose. Right. That's well said. Yes. And I, I didn't want to implicate, right, that the, uh, the cultures who do what you called it sustainable whaling, or, or it's a part of sustenance whaling is what it is and that's what it is you know and i don't want to confuse that with the larger problem as you perfectly eloquently mentioned it is us and it's our technology and it's our basically our apathy to what we are throwing all these plastics microplastics and letting everything get out of control in the ocean your sculptures because they do have the benefit of people can hold these whale heads in their hands you know and they're learning about the different textural qualities in the sculptures, these uh, marks on the whale, certain growths on the whale, all of that is represented in your sculpture so people can 
touch it and really get a sense of the whale, the, the quality of what makes a whale, what whaleness is, you know, and that's an experience that most of us won't have without endangering a whale because we're not going to get up close to to these creatures. You know, we don't want to stress them out. And that your sculptures also do have some found objects like entanglements, bungee cords, plastics, and whatever else you've incorporated into these sculptures. So you're using found objects that are actually uh, representative of the discarded objects that we throw into the water and affect these whales. So it's a really educational. You can see the, the value in that. As a work of art, too, it's compelling. And I feel like a work of art should do that. And I was going to ask you about other natural like sort of the term i guess naturalist art and you spoke to that so that was a question that i had is so many people do make whale paintings i know because cape cod where you got your start in the marine biology fieldwork cape cod is full of just like weekend warrior painters or just hobbyists and, and professional artists alike you know who are all making it and selling these these whale paintings you know on on the docks and in the local galleries they do draw your appreciation to the whales, you know, and a lot of people go there to do these whale watching experiences. And there's definitely a difference, you know, because a lot of these whale paintings, there's not so much of an educational aspect to it. To me, it's just more like of a mimesis. It's kind of like just like copying nature. That was something that I, I wanted to ask you about. It's an interesting dichotomy when you talk about like naturalism and art, you know, there's different ways that artists have been uh, using nature. And of course, a lot of it has a basis in education and conservation, but there's two sides of it, I think. Yeah, I reckon so. Um, the art scene that you see in Provincetown and in coastal communities um, like Gloucester, Newport, um, if you go up to a Washington State, the San Juan Islands, there's Friday Harbor, um, and especially in Lahaina, there are all these artist communities, and a lot of them are making like nautical marine figurations where there's going to be like whale imagery, like coastal scenes, and that art definitely has its its own environment and its own audience, and those are valid in their own rights and it's something that i wrestled with because i went to school to learn i suppose objectivity and skill in drawing so i came into the art world from a formalist background and i was really drawn to the new york school in like the 1950s with franz klein and mark rothko color theorists and I was surprised to see myself making things that were very objective and it mimics the art that you do see in those coastal galleries. So I was telling myself like, Oh no, have I become like this kind of artist that like sells art in vacation towns? Um, but vacation towns just happen to be where the subject matter of my interests exists. So, um, that, that, it's been funny because I have interacted with some of those communities. The, um, Atelier Gallery is up in Friday Harbor. It's a bunch of more accomplished artists. Um, I honestly had mistaken them for being what Timothy Harney would call it, Sunday painters. And the Sunday painter is like the old school term for a weekend warrior. But these were people who were like working like seven days a week at their craft. And they confessed to me they were nervous when I joined their community because they just thought I was going to be another nautical scene painter. Um, but what surprised them was that I was coming at whale imagery from a formalist standpoint, but I was also being abstract. I think when I started, my MO was to paint my subject matter in a way that I haven't seen it painted before. So painting whales from unusual angles or emphasizing anatomy that's usually neglected in other portrayals. Um, yeah, so I came into this field with that background and I feel that for years now I have benefited. I'm a beneficiary of whales really. Like they sustain me Economically speaking, they keep my intellectual curiosity alive. And 
they sustain me as an organism as they're cultivating plankton and fish with the nutrients that they recycle. And that plankton accounts for 50% of Earth's breathable oxygen. So I am indebted to these whales. So as their ambassador, it's my duty to push beyond just formalist ideas and to talk about conservation, like in a literal context as a whale watch guy, but also as an artist. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting to see what the old school painters, the formalists think in general about art having a utilitarian purpose, you know, because it was very much what they were pushing back against. I think like, you know, people like Franz Klein, Motherwell, Rothko, there was this poetry in the art, you know, and that was all it is like the art for art's sake in a way, very uh, much the individual, you know, of course, that's part of it. And it is important. And art means so much to so many different people. It'd be interesting, obviously, to see what they think of how art has evolved in both its, uh, the, the way people are teaching art, the way and the way people are making art, and how it's become even more a thing that people in the public can access. I think it's obviously better because art education since then has become something that is available for everyone. It was a very limited thing then. Now, I mean, so many people are going to art school and then art educational programming is available in so many different schools and also nonprofits. And that extends into STEAM and science and technology combining with the art, which is where we get to the work that you do coming from a formalist background, it's expanded into this conceptual idea that still combines the very true painterly styles. I mean, your work is incredibly painterly. It's got great textures. Looking at it as an abstract object and a painting as well, you can do that. And when I was focusing in on just the, the details of the baleen and those textural marks of, on the whale, but you're looking at those uh, elements and it's very much an abstract painting as well. So you're, you're really giving us the aesthetic beauty of the whale, as well as this diagram, this very tangible diagram. For me, it's coming from the art world. It's, it's a way for me to learn more about science and, and get close to it. And using the vocabulary I know as an artist and an art historian, I then can translate that you know, to learning about marine biology through the work you do because of how accessible it is. And you're using, you're creating this universal language through painting. So I think that's definitely where the ode to formalism comes in. You know, the, what they were trying to do is create this universal language. And I think there's a lot to be said that, yes, art has, especially abstract art, has created this universal language that we can communicate with, really transcending just art for art's sake. We can use that vocabulary to create meaningful messages that connect you know, the arts with sciences. So yeah, and those the painters, you know, in the tourist towns, it's definitely something I don't want to dismiss them. And I'm glad to hear you explaining the importance of, of the work they do. And especially that it's in these highly populated destinations, which people flood to them in the summer or the seasonal areas. And it is there that they're interacting with the whales and buying these paintings, you know, it not only supports the artists, but I do think like you've said, it, it extends beyond that, that it also can support the whales and the way we see whales and, and probably build some empathy towards these beautiful creatures. We're buying beautiful artwork and it would probably, hopefully, the hope is maybe it would lead to more compassionate ways of living. There's a difference you know, between the work you're doing and the work they're doing, but it sounded like there was, you found somewhat of a community and a conversation when you were interacting together. And it would be interesting to, did, if they learned anything from the work you were doing, how, if that might have affected their vision or their inspiration. So I think there's something to be said for all art. You know, there's an educational value in all art, but there's clearly a differentiation between the type of tourist marine painting and the conceptual and pedagogical and utilitarian marine inspired artwork. Yeah, it's actually really rejuvenating to talk to someone with more of an arts education kind of background because a lot of my interactions now are either with general public or with other naturalists and scientists. So I, I don't get to talk to another artist often about my own artwork. So it's really interesting um, to have your insights and interpretations of what I'm doing. And 
to have someone ask about my relationship to artists in those communities. And when I was living in San Juan Island up in Friday Harbor, a lot of the figuration was nautical, um, but it was intriguing. Um, there was this one artist um, who made these photorealistic paintings of waves and just an enormous body of work. She was always in the studio and it was just like, you know, just a wave like frozen in time. Um, but she was very like formalist and photorealistic about it. And then um, there was another artist who would um, like, she would just find these piles of driftwood on beaches and treat them as a still life. And she would play around with like different lighting and times of day. She'd take those photos back to her studio and work off of those. But then you would talk to them and what they would talk about would vary um, from what they were portraying. Like they were all very cognizant about conservation because in the San Juan Islands, that's where a lot of timber was felled and um, you have a lot of invasive trees planted, a lot of um, places cut down for livestock. And currently they're dealing with a problem with um, resident killer whales, the Orcanus orca population up north, they've been decimated because of the damming of rivers that have impacted salmon population. So their prey has been disappearing, and so have they. And one of the artists in those studios actually worked also as a naturalist on the boats. And her art was a lot more abstract and didn't quite represent those very issues that I address. So as artists, they were very cognizant of conservation issues, but in their art, it was either subtly implied or not visually represented. So I think that's where my art falls right now, is that I need to communicate um, these plights that animals face. But um, in doing so, I try to speak to the individual by regarding a whale as an individual. And maybe that's something I can get into later, but humpback whales can be identified as individual beings. And there are stories that some of them carry in the tail patterns and in their scars and such. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting, like coming from my background and having my own conservation mission and going in blind into these communities, not knowing if I'll be accepted or if I'm speaking a language that they're just not speaking visually. That's interesting because you are at the, this sort of precipice of both worlds, the art world and the marine biology world, and you're very informed in both and very active in both and networking with people in both fields. And on that part, you've spoken about, you know, the fine artists, the very like formal fine artists and how their work is different than yours. I mean, true, in your work, you can really see the individuality that you mentioned in each, well, each painting is very different. That's not often the case with some, you know, of the, the more tourist type of marine art that you would see. But yet, I mean, again, there's like a, a something to be said about that work too, because it does give you an appreciation and maybe a want or a thirst to explore whales more. And then they get to the work that you're making, which is more differentiated and actually hones in on both the aesthetic qualities of the whales. The, when you actually get to see individual elements of these whales up close, you have so much more detail. And again, also there's a dual purpose to it. It's a both a, a work of art. Each one is different, and it's also a universal way of of teaching about these creatures. And we get a, a good sense because, as you said, we can't really get face to face with them. But your work, you really can because they're scaled down models of the facial features of the whale, and you can actually touch them as well as see them. So I wonder if you could talk about too, because you you mentioned the responses or some of the uh, ways your work has been coexisting or juxtaposed with the fine art community who's also making whale inspired paintings but what about the the marine biology community the scientific community you know what have they thought about 
the use of art. Is this like a, is this a novel thing or is this sort of a, an emerging zeitgeist amongst the marine biologists? Because I know it's a very visual field. Science is very visual and there's so many ways that art and science have connected and should connect further. But yeah, I wonder in your experiences, what has, what has the response been? So uh, going in, there was some instant validation that I had to accept, but also measure. Um, where when I started with my scientific orientation, it, it was with illustration. Um, it was with tail patterns of humpback whales, particularly on Stoagon Bank, which is why the name of my workshop is called Tales of Stoagon. And Immediately, um, it was a 2017 conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And up there, I had like a few dozen like drawings of humpback whale tail patterns. And on the humpback whale, you've got like a 15 foot wide fluke, a tail, and there'll be a black and white pattern of pigmentation underneath. And those are like fingerprints. And no two humpback whales have the same tail pattern for anyone listening who doesn't know. <clears throat> and people would immediately say those took you a while to make because they're very intricate patterns, some of them. And what I found were that a lot of researchers at that conference worked with humpback whale identification and they would immediately recognize the whale that I had illustrated. Oh, wow. So there was, there was yeah. There's a novelty to that, definitely. Um, reaching out to these biologists as individuals. But um, I started talking with uh, Regina Esmudia. She works with whale and dolphin conservation. It's a nonprofit out of Plymouth. I definitely botched her last name. And I worked with her on a grant project where I was constructing sculptures that would speak of fluke patterns, talk about entanglements, address the North Atlantic right whales who are of an endangered status. So I had some more like solidification of my message there, like having actual funding behind a body of work. I've come to find out that being an artist in the scientific community, a lot of these scientists are like, secretly artists themselves but they just haven't found an application for that skill set um i worked with one artist alex borsma and she's doing a lot of great work on the west coast right now she collaborated with harvard university in identifying an extinct species of sperm whale but she is a very prolific scientific illustrator and she created plates for a book, uh, Spying on Whales by Nick Pison. And it's a book just about whale evolution. And she's got a lot of these great, like, cuts, black and white, of, like, whale anatomy, whale behavior, like, feeding scenes, uh, fossils, all this great stuff. And there's a lot of people like that in the field. And they think when they see my work and how persistent I am, with my own subject matter. I like to think I've encouraged at least some of them to try and combine the two disciplines. So it's been a lot of good feedback. The only pushback I've had has just been in applying for scientific positions because my background is in fine arts. So at first it was impossible to find naturalist jobs outside of Boston, like, like any other feel like maybe 97 out of 100 times like you never get a response but as i've stayed in the field longer or like earning more of a reputation it's been a little easier to move about but at the beginning like impossible to find any jobs in marine biology just like it was impossible finding jobs in art in boston at the time yeah, there is definitely a connection between the history of biological renderings and scientific discoveries and ecological conservation. And, you know, Ustad uh, Mansour, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but the Mughal 
painter from the 17th century who we know what a dodo bird looks like because of him. More of the other European or Eurocentric representations of the bird have been flagged down by scientists and, and naturalists as, as being more fantastical, but his was very representative to the actual species. So without his work, scientists who had never experienced dodo bird, they wouldn't have known what it looked like. So yeah, so there's a lot to be said for artists who use their astute sense of both observation and their skills for rendering imagery. There's a lot to be said with the benefits of how that impacts scientific knowledge and further efforts to conserve and to educate and to talk about biology and all that. So there's definitely more of a focus, you know, in art education as well to incorporate the sciences and other disciplines too, because, you know, we're not living in a vacuum. There's so many different demands now. It's like, it'd be great if someone can be a gallery artist or whatever, and anyone who wants to, it'd be great if they had that option. But there's times when you have to be flexible. The arts teach us that. And your work is an example of how flexibility and the different habits of mind that you use and develop as an artist can be incorporated into other fields and other professions as well, while still retaining the identity of an artist and making serious artwork. So hopefully, I, I think the goal that we're doing in art education and, and in creating multidisciplinary artwork is that we're making it possible for us to interact and also to work in other fields. And, and having our artistic background be taken as a serious qualification for science and engineering and everything, because there is definitely that connection. I mean, you know, and we're talking right now about how art is more than just pictures or 2D objects, 3D objects. You know, it's it's the experience and what we're gathering culturally and scientifically and all around how it's benefiting the way we see the world and change the world. So I'm glad to hear that there is some evolution from your end on how you've been navigating both worlds. And certainly also to anyone listening who is interested in, in both fields, there is obviously a lot of options and hopefully more kids going into art school come away with that sense of my identity as an artist is multifaceted. The art world has expanded so much as so much competition. And one of the ways to, I think, help, you know, and to find your own place in that world is to uh, expand, you know, and that's, that's, I think, where art is going. What can both fields do better to support one another and uh, maybe what advice you would give to someone who is maybe on the scientific end, they, they're they creative. How could they use their creativity more to have breakthroughs in their fields? To, and on the other end, how can the artists who are interested in conservation and environmental issues and animals, biology in general, how can they make a contribution? You know, there's people with expertise in both things, you know, and how can they work together? How can we collaborate better? Well, I would encourage artists and creatives to embrace whatever uniqueness they identify in themselves and to look at it as a niche. The going into a field that I was unfamiliar with, I don't think I had really seen a humpback whale or rather experienced one in totality until I was like 27. I was going into a field as an intern and I was the oldest intern in that program in Boston. And where I am right now, I'm one of the oldest naturalists with my particular enterprise. So I've never really quite fit in um, wherever I've gone. And before that was very disconcerting, but now I certainly try to use that as a strength. So I'd encourage artists if like they're feeling out of place, if they're applying to a field they're unfamiliar with, that's a good thing because they're not already seeing themselves in that field. And I mean, I come from a place of privilege, like as much as I've worked quite hard in my career, like I haven't had to contend with a lot of barriers that other individuals have. Um, so I do keep that in mind when I talk about my own narrative, but it's what my colleagues Stephanie stack called, um, sending the elevator back down where if you're already in the field and you're established and you see like someone who's disadvantaged or discouraged, but they show promise is to like elevate them and bring them back up. So in addition to artists becoming involved in new fields, 
like certainly group together as a community and head into it because if I had more of a community when I got into science at the beginning, I probably would have been making the art I make now years ago, but I just didn't have a sounding board really. Like I was just stuck in my echo chamber of my own experience. And for artists who want to become involved in science and engineering or technology, just find something that interests you and just try to interpret that forever, whatever medium you are most engaged with. Like maybe I, I've seen artists who do crocheting and like knitting that get into like stem cell research. And because their medium is so particular, they might not have seen it around and it's not because it doesn't work. It's just because it hasn't been explored. So just like the naturalists of like the 17 and 1800s do like just use the tools of your trade and explore where other people haven't. And we're not, we're not sec ecotypes of personhood. Like we don't have to identify just as a scientist or just as an artist because it's not just artists that look at art. It's, all people it's a universal language um so as long as art is a conduit of expression you can speak to anyone in any field if that's not too broadly speaking that's 100 percent on point i think that's great advice for everyone i mean and it's good for art educators to take into consideration as well you know we shouldn't have to advocate for our profession but there are people who fail to see you know at the top the policymakers, some maybe some administrators might not be as knowledgeable about the arts as other backgrounds because a lot of principals don't come from teaching art they come from teaching maybe other subjects it's just the way it is you know and the arts are always at risk of funding cuts but it's a way of looking at art as a universal language and part of the core language curriculum we want to teach students to be individuals and express themselves and to find connections in everyday life now that's what art really does you're talking about knitting and all these different skills that have such a educational history as well because knitting is something passed down it it's it's an oral tradition as well as a a tangible tradition it's when people would tell stories would teach each other while they're knitting and so there's so much that the history of art and the contemporary practices of art and craft in general have connections to teaching and learning and that's why it's definitely a subject that is you know when we think about art we should be thinking really about that it's boundless i mean the possibilities and what you can do what can be considered art is is boundless i mean this has been an amazing conversation you know inspiring to me um it's definitely raising my conscious you know i'm actually i'm looking you know closely and i think if there's anything to take away from art it's to look at it closely and to really sit with it enjoy it and that's the same with nature you know enjoy it I mean, I'm sure people that are listening to this who might be interested as well. And so many of the interests that you've created this career, this multidisciplinary career out of, you know, there's people who might be interested as well, you know, in conservation, whether it's flora, fauna, and who are growing up as the creative kids in their school as well and want to do both. They're passionate about both. There is a possibility. And the path that you took, both your educational path and your ongoing career, shows how that's possible so thank you for all that this is amazing uh and educational and informative and i hope inspiring for others too as it is for for us talking about it right on thank you adam that's that's far too kind but i will i will take that thank you <laughs> well, i'd like to thank my guest rich dolan for coming on and joining me in this inspiring conversation today i learned a lot i hope you did as well and if you did enjoy this episode please help support artfully learning by hitting that like button and subscribing to my channel. And stay tuned for more episodes to come as well.